Existence and identity are two of the most important concepts in philosophy, and they're particularly important when we're thinking about how things have to be or how things might have been. So let's take a look at existence and identity from the perspective of quantified modal logic. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We have been talking about modal logic and we've kind of hit a stumbling block. We want to understand existence and identity in the context not just of how things are, but also how they could have been and how they have to be. And we've hit on a problem because we think there could have been things that don't in fact exist. And we also think that there are things that exist, like you and me, who don't have to exist, who might not have existed. How are we going to make sense of all of that in quantified modal logic? So that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. If you're finding this stuff interesting, if the videos are useful, why don't you hit the subscribe button? I'd really appreciate it. So these are issues that come up in deciding exactly what our semantics is going to look like and how we interpret the formal semantics. So part of it is about using philosophy to inform the kind of logic we want. But the other part of it is using our logical tools to kind of work out philosophically what to say about these difficult issues. So part of what we're going to be looking at here is kind of technical and logical, but part of it is going to be philosophical and conceptual. So, yes, I'm looking forward to that. OK, so this issue about existence kind of came up when we talked about constant domain semantics and this idea that if we have a constant domain model, then we're always talking about the same things in every possible world. Every possible world has the same domain. So in this constant domain model, we've got two things, A and B, in every possible world. And as a consequence of that, whatever exists, it's going to be necessary that those things and just those things exist. And that's already starting to sound a little bit philosophically dubious because we think that there might have been more or fewer things than in fact there are. OK, so let's go into a little bit of detail on exactly how these problems come up. So let's just revise our semantics for identity, for existence and for necessity. We say that an identity statement is true at a possible world, just in case whatever we interpret A as is the same thing that we interpret B as. So if A and B are the same thing, that sentence is true, regardless of what else happens at that state. Existence, well, exists in X, A, that's going to be true in a model, just in case in the variant model where we take the variable X and we make it point at some object in the domain, that makes A come out true. OK, if we can do that for some object in the domain, there exists an XA, that's going to be true. Box A, that's going to be true at a world S, just in case A is true at every accessible world. So every world accessible to S, A is true. If we put those three clauses together, then we see why this problem arises. So A is identical to A. That is a logical truth. It's true at every possible world. So something is A. That's also going to be true at every possible world. And because that's true at every possible world, it's going to be necessary that it's true. So at every possible world, it's going to be necessary that A exists. And we don't just get that de dicto necessity. This bit here is de dicto. We also get the corresponding de re necessity. There is something which necessarily exists. The constant domain semantics legitimizes that move from the de dicto version to the de re version. And that de re version, that seems to be especially philosophically problematic because it says that there is this thing and that thing essentially exists. Of necessity, it exists. And, you know, if you think about it, there doesn't appear to be many things like that. So for absolutely anything you care to name, at any possible world, something there is identical to it. Yeah, that doesn't sound very plausible. So I set that problem up in terms of these three semantic clauses. So you might think, OK, we just need to fiddle our semantics a bit and the problem will go away. 
But it's not quite as easy as that. We can also look at it on the side of the proof theory of modal logic. So if you remember back when we talked about this for propositional modal logic, we had this rule, the necessitation rule. If something is a logical truth, then it should be necessary. It should be a logical truth that it's necessary. OK, now if we stick with that rule, and it seems pretty plausible that logical truths should be necessarily true, then we can get the problem kind of ignoring whatever semantics we use. Because then we can reason like this. It's a logical truth, at least in first order logic, that something is A. So because it's a logical truth, we can say it's necessary that something is A. In other words, A necessarily exists. OK, that sounds bad. And we can also get the de Ray version because we can reason like this. Everything is identical to itself. A is identical to A. That's a logical truth. So it's necessary. And from there, we can use existential generalization to say something is necessarily identical to A. OK, and treat that as a theorem. OK, so we're just using rules there, logical rules that we've established previously for first order logic and modal logic. And we get this problem. So what this shows us is that if we want to avoid this problem by avoiding sentences like this being logically true, being theorems, then we can't just use all of the logical rules that we've used up to this point. We have to wind back on some of them. And we have to say that something that counted as a logical truth before, say in first order logic, isn't going to count as a logical truth when we move to quantified modal logic. And that, that doesn't sound so great. OK, so now let's think about some potential solutions to this issue. And basically, there's two broad ways we can go. One is we can think about a different semantics for quantified modal logic. So we're just going to vary it a little bit. Rather than having the constant domain semantics, we could develop variable domain semantics. Now, that is quite tricky. So I'm going to talk about that in a different video. We're going to go into detail there, but we're going to kind of go through that slow because it does get a bit tricky. The other approach is to revisit what we mean by this symbol. OK, so this isn't so much of a logical one. It's more of a philosophical interpretation of the logic. So you might go like this. Yep, there are these logical truths involving this symbol, which are necessarily true. But we shouldn't take this to mean exists, or at least shouldn't take it to mean exists in the usual sense. And by doing that, we can kind of step back a little bit from the problematic aspects of saying that everything necessarily exists. So for the rest of this video, we're just going to talk about that second approach, this philosophical reinterpretation of the existential quantifier to try to kind of diffuse this problem. So maybe when people first encounter this kind of move, sort of reinterpreting what the symbols mean so that the existential quantifier doesn't mean exists anymore, so we no longer have to say that everything necessarily exists, maybe that seems a bit like cheating. But, you know, let me try and warm you up to it with, with a kind of a parallel example. So now let's not think so much about different possibilities. Let's think about, say, the past. So think about a character who really did exist, not now, but in the past. So take Hypatia, the Greek philosopher. She lived in Egypt around 350 BC. Um, she was a philosopher, mathematician, astronomer. So she had various properties, like being a philosopher, being an astronomer. And because of that, it seems like we can ascribe properties to her now. For instance, having been an astronomer, having been a philosopher. Those are things that are really true of her now, OK? It's not the case that she's a philosopher now, but it is the case now that she was a philosopher. So if we can ascribe properties like having been a philosopher to Hypatia, doesn't there have to be a sense in which she does exist? OK, she doesn't exist now. She doesn't exist in the concrete, material, physical sense of being part of the, the world around us. But there is a kind of thin, logical sense in which she exists, the sense in which we can ascribe properties like having been a philosopher to her. OK, that thin, semantic or logical sense, that is going to be a way of reading the existential quantifier. OK, people might say when we say there is an X, X is identical to Hypatia. That basically just means this thin logical sense, the sense that allows us to say, you know, Hypatia is identical to Hypatia. Hypatia was a Greek philosopher, that kind of stuff. 
OK, suppose we take that move to be, you know, reasonably convincing. Then we can move from the case of the past to different possible worlds. Because in some sense, different possible worlds stand to the actual world a little bit like how the past or the future stands to the present. So just as we can say things like Hypatia doesn't now exist, but she did exist, we can also say things like just as Pegasus doesn't actually exist, but could have existed. So there might be a sense in which Pegasus or, you know, Robin Hood or whatever doesn't actually exist, but does exist in this thin sense in which we can ascribe properties to them. So, you know, if we think that Pegasus could have existed, then it seems like we're saying Pegasus has the property of being a possible existent. Maybe we do want to say that Pegasus is self-identical, even though it doesn't actually exist. So these are all ways in which we might want to say that there is this thin sense of existence that maybe we can apply to non-actual things like Pegasus. OK, and maybe we can express this with the existential quantifier. OK, so these philosophical debates about existence and identity, particularly as they relate to modal logic, quantified modal logic, there's an awful lot of philosophical richness there. There's no way that we're going to capture it all in this really short video. So I just kind of wanted to give you a taster of how these kind of arguments might go. OK, guys, that is all for today. I hope you found this discussion interesting. In videos coming up, we're going to be looking more at this topic in a more kind of logical sense. We're going to be looking at variable domain semantics in quantified modal logic. So I hope you join me back for that. Thank you for all your comments and questions. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys next time. <laughs>